Fae are a major creature type in Dungeons & Dragons, and they have a long history in the game. Like many types of monsters, they're drawn from real-world mythology and folklore, primarily Greek, Roman, Celtic, Germanic, and Norse. Fae often have humanoid-like bodies, though not always. They typically possess supernatural powers, most commonly of the enchantment and illusion types, and they have close connections with nature. They're also associated with elves, or really elves are associated with Fae. Elves have Fae ancestry and as such are deeply bonded with the forest lands and plants. They love beauty and the arts, and they often have those free or wild temperaments that are common amongst Fae. And of course, elves are also connected with magic. The earliest Fae entries are the Nixie and the Pixie, appearing in the original Dungeons and Dragons set in 1974, aka the White Box, when the game was just evolving out of chainmail before the books even had color full art hardcovers. 1977 saw the release of the more complex system, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and the original monster manual included such fey as the Brownie, Leprechaun, Nymph, Satyr, and Sprite, as well as the Sylph, though it later became an elemental creature. The homeland of the Fae is the Feywild. That name actually came about in 4th edition, however. Before then, it was usually called the Plane of Fairy. The Feywild is a parallel plane. In other words, it's an echo of the material plane or the mortal world. It represents dreams and the supernatural and is altogether quite an intense place. Colors are more vivid. Emotions are more passionate. Nature is bigger and wilder and magic thrums through everything. Like humanoids, Fey organize themselves into various factions and hierarchies. Foremost are the Fey Courts. The Summer Court, the Winter Court, the Wild Court, and the Gloaming Court are the major ones that we typically hear about. Each court has a ruler, a king or a queen, or some other such grand entity known as an Archfey, which are beings of tremendous power on the same level as ancient dragons, archdevils, demon lords, and so on. They're only outmatched by the gods. You'll also hear the terms seely and unseely at times, which refer to the two different perspectives taken by Fey. In oversimplified terms, seely are good aligned and unseely are evil aligned, though it is a bit more nuanced than that. Some argue that the unseely merely believe that it's best to remain detached from mortals, that even helping a human in a moment of dire or desperate need might spark a chain reaction that ultimately leads to harm for the Fae. So what do Fae represent as an archetype or a trope? Well, they symbolize our dreams, our sense of wonder and mystery. In this sense, they are in fact embodiments of the fantasy genre itself. That's what a fantasy is, a dream, whether while you sleep or while you consciously daydream. Things can be romanticized or magical, also unpredictable, even bewildering at times. When you walk into the woods and get a little bit lost, you hear a distant giggle or the echo of a song, and you wonder about hidden folk or spirits or witches or elves. All the adventure and all the allure and all the danger that they contain, that is fantasy. That is fey. Before we jump into the monster entries, I must make a persuasion check to convince you to subscribe, as it is clearly the most mutually beneficial course of action. Hmm, is that good enough? I'd better try deception as well. If you subscribe, a gorgeous fairy person will come and fulfill your wildest dreams. Oh my, are they going to buy that? I'll throw an intimidation in there as well, just for good measure. No! Listen here, you sniveling ninny hammers! You either hit that subscribe button, or a hag's curse will be upon you, and all your d20s will roll five or lower for the rest of your lives. Hm, that ought to do it. Now let's get into the ranking. For this, I use a rating system that takes into account five different aspects of a creature. For each attribute, I have a specific guideline that I follow to determine its score. Mechanics has to do with how interesting and fun the monster's abilities are in the stat block. Style is largely the creature's aesthetic, but it also takes into account its overall tone and attitude. 
Role-playing is basically a way of saying social interaction. Some creatures don't interact with the characters beyond simply attacking them, while other creatures are bursting full of dialogue and engagement. Lore is all about the stories and the hooks. Stories give us the background and the ecology of the monster, while providing the creature with depth and meaning. Hooks give the characters something interesting to follow, the quest lead, so to say. Versatility refers to how flexible the monster is in its modes of existence. A low versatility creature repeats the same single pattern over and over, while a high versatility creature has a wide variety of goals and can fill almost any role in the game. Of course, sometimes there are ties when I add up the creature's score, in which case I tie break based on my own personal preferences. You, the DM, can always decide to breathe additional life into a low tier monster. You can add on abilities or give it a unique variation of some kind. The beauty of D&D is that it's your game and you're encouraged to get creative. I'm not here to rate your skills though. I'm just looking at what is actually presented in the books here I'll be referencing 5th edition's Monster Manual, Volo's Guide to Monsters, and Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. Now we pass through the Fey Crossing. The trees stretch taller and more verdant. Animals whisper riddles to us. And if we step into the wrong grove, we might just find ourselves beset by sprite arrows or witch curses. F-tier monsters are the most basic, simple, and one-dimensional, or they are the annoyingly poorly designed ones. In the case of Fey, I found none in F-tier. D-tier monsters have a slight glimmer of greatness, but they're held back by major limitations. The Blink Dog might not be a creature that comes to mind when you think about Fey. In the Monster Manual, it's tucked into the miscellaneous creatures section that comes after all the alphabetized monsters. So you'll only come across it if you're reading through all the animals. It's on the same page as the baboon, the badger, the bat, and the black bear. And it only gets a tiny paragraph of lore. However, we do find out a bit more about it in the Displacer Beast lore, which I covered in my Monstrosities video. Basically, the Displacer Beast originated in the Feywild, and the Fey of the Unseelie Court, who aren't exactly nice guys, captured the Displacer Beasts and trained them to hunt down unicorns, pegasi, and other noble creatures. The Monster Manual states that it didn't take the Displacer Beasts long to use their malevolent intelligence to escape their masters. It doesn't make total sense to me, as their intelligence is only six, and they speak no languages, and they don't have opposable thumbs, so whenever and however the Displacer Beast did escape, this caught the attention of the Seely Court, who are more likely to be virtuous or helpful. The Seely have a long-standing tradition of training blink dogs, much like humans training typical hounds. This also accounts for why the blink dogs are lawful good, which is a rare alignment for Fey, but it's a fitting expression of the combination of a loyal dog and a compassionate Fey. So the Seelie and their Blink Dogs hunted down the Displacer Beast, yet at the same time it, they also drove some of the Displacer Beasts into the Material Plane. And for whatever reason, the Fey Blink Dog teams didn't bother to just follow or track down the Displacer Beasts and finish what they started. And because of that history, Blink Dogs forever hate Displacer Beasts and attack them on sight. Which also seems a bit odd, as it would really take a big group of CR one quarter blink dogs to take down the bigger, stronger CR three displacer beasts. And certainly, some of the blink dogs would die in the struggle. Can you imagine a group of regular dogs attacking something that's stronger than a rhinoceros? Hmm. Mechanics wise, the blink dog bites, it has keen senses, it can teleport up to 40 feet thus the origin of its name, as it blinks in and out of thin air. It is also an intelligent, sentient creature that's as smart as the average person and speaks its own language called Blink Dog. Off Rof. Rof bok 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 rof. Rofy bok 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 off oof. Rofy? This canine of the Feywild fills a neat little position in the D&D cosmos, but overall, it's not a very strong entry. In fact, it's the only D-tier monster in this ranking. We're already seeing how the Fey are quite an interesting group. 
C-tier monsters represent those that are either a mix of good and bad, or just flat all around average. In low C-tier, we find yet another dog-like fey. It actually has a human-like face and a long, flexible neck. It's kind of odd, but I do like it. In a way, it reminds me of a Jim Henson creature. As hounds, these monsters live in packs, though they do not breed nor produce offspring. They are actually created by archfey of the darker variety, such as the Queen of Air and Darkness from the Gloaming Court. They have that classic essence of fey spirits, as opposed to fully flesh and blood natural species. The archfey who create the Yeth Hounds award them to thralls and heroes who have garnered such favor. The hounds serve their new masters fervently, so much so that should their masters perish, they will seek out a new master, typically a necromancer, a vampire lord, some other grim champion. Once bonded, the Yeth Hounds are telepathically linked to their master and serve him unwaveringly. Yeth Hounds appear to be made out of smoke and shadow, and they fly as readily as they run. Their eternal weakness is sunlight, which banishes them to the ethereal plane where they must wait until their master comes to guide them back. Yeth Hounds really tread the borderline between Fey and Undead. Speaking of which, you know how incorporeal undead in 5th edition resist non-magical weapons? Ghosts, wraiths, specters, etc. These creatures can pass right through solid matter, yet they're still harmed, at half the normal amount, by mundane weapons. You could beat a ghost to death with a bar stool. You could punch a ghost into oblivion. It really makes no sense to me. In 3.5e, incorporeal undead were unaffected by mundane weapons, and there was a 50% chance that magic weapons would function. That makes much more sense. Now we look at the 5e Yeth Hound, and lo and behold, it is immune to non-magical weapons, unless they're silvered. Yet, the Yeth Hound does not have the incorporeal trait. It comes off as inconsistent in design. Now it is true that some other monsters do have this same kind of immunity to non-magical weapons. Demon Lords, that's who. I'm talking Demogorgon, Orcus, Zugtmoy. <laughs> oh boy. In combat, a Yeth Hound has two main offensive options. A single bite that deals additional psychic damage to frightened targets, and a baleful baying, a supernatural howl with an impressive radius of 300 feet that rouses a panic-inducing fear in those who hear it, unless they overcome it with a wisdom saving throw. The Yeth Hound is a bit wacky and awkward, but also kind of interesting and flavorful, so go Yeth Hound. The Boggle follows the time-honored tradition of the mischief makers, such as the Imp, Goblin, Kobold, Gremlin, Boggart, Boogie, Brownie, so on which all seem to stem back from the Kobalus of ancient Greek mythology. The Boggle is like a miniature boogeyman who hides in the dark nooks of your house and likes to cause trouble. It's chaotic neutral, which roughly translates to it being uncontrollable and problematic, but without any intentions of great harm or corruption. It causes unfortunate events, not malevolence. And hey, maybe you can find some comedy in its pranks. Some people are able to keep boggles as servants or minions, but it does require a lot of charismatic force to keep them in line. They grow restless quickly. A fey packed warlock is an easy example of a boggle master. But I could also see a druid or a ranger, maybe even a wizard with fey inclination, even a wild sorcerer. What a pair that would be. On an adventure, a boggle would serve the role of burglar or spy, but not warrior. They're physically frail. Generally, they spook when it comes to direct conflict. A boggle likes to pester, not brawl. And what's with them anyway? Why all the naughty tricks? Well, what do all the class clowns and jackass punks want? Attention. They're deeply lonely or they've been hurt by neglect, so they manifest the shadow of their desire for genuine attention. What is a court jester without a court to react to him, after all? Boggles really can't deal any damage to speak of, 
They wield just a weak punch. Their main abilities are Boggle Oil and Dimensional Rift. The Rift is like a very minor form of Dimension Door, which the Boggle makes in bounded openings like windows or doorways or even bed frames. Its oil can be sticky or slippery. The sticky variety allows it to grab onto things and adhere to them, even granting it the ability to spider climb or create a sort of glue trap puddle. The slippery oil variety makes the Boggle difficult to pin down and can cause enemies to slip and fall. The Boggle really has potential. It's at the top of C tier, but I wish it was in B tier. It just needs a little something more. A couple tricky ranged attacks would be great. They could be oil globs or even fey alchemical pots with minor effects that hinder and confuzzle the enemies. Or how about some better lore? It seems that 5th edition likes to spend paragraphs describing things that are either A, redundant, we don't need multiple paragraphs over explaining how boggles are scoundrels and dirty tricksters, or B, redundant. We don't need multiple paragraphs over explaining what the Boggles' abilities do when we can just read the stat block and see what they do. How about some interesting lore that gives us unique details, or intriguing stories, or adventure leads that we can follow? Bleh! Hoggle is Hoggle's friend! Hoggle is Hoggle's friend! And just like that, we are through C tier. Not many residents here either. We're already in B tier, and man, are there some great entries up ahead. I think I'll just take a quick nap in this ring of toadstools. <sighs> B tier is where monsters start to shine and glow and swirl with patterns of amazing colors. Whoa, look at the colors! I should get off the boat, I'm Gone are the multiple major hang-ups, or simply moderately cool features. Here are the Dazzlers of the Feywild. The Mean Lock is a- whoa, wait. The Mean Lock? A Fey? You've gotta be kidding me. Isn't the Mean Lock an aberration? Like, one of the greatest aberrations ever? It received first place on my top 10 scariest D&D monsters video. All right, let's take a look at this and see what's going on here. The Mean Lock debuted in 1981 in the first edition Fiend Folio for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. They're described as horrid, two-foot-tall things that dwell in dark layers at the bottom of shafts. They can cause fear in low-level characters, and their claws can induce paralysis. And they have a minor dimension door type ability that they use to get around. Their main behavior is to stalk an adventuring party, trailing in the darkness at a distance, and sending telepathic mental disturbances to a target victim of the party, preferably a paladin or a human. The victim continually sees movement out of the corner of his eye and hears vague, scary sounds like scratching or shuffling. In other words, he gets more and more paranoid that something is following him and coming to take him away, which actually is true in this case. This saps his focus, making him slowly wear down until finally the mean locks do come and drag him back to their lair to transform him into one of their own. It's great stuff, right out of a nightmare. The first edition Fiend Folio, while it doesn't have such a thing as a creature type, certainly does not present the mean lock as a fae. It's also worth noting that the mean lock is lawful evil, which is a very rare alignment for fae. Then we come to 2nd edition, which brought back the Mean Lock in the Monstrous Compendium Annual, Volume 2, as well as in a couple adventure modules. Here it is essentially identical to how it was presented in 1st edition. In 2002, the early days of 3rd edition, the Mean Lock made a comeback in Monster Manual 2. Now, each creature had an official creature type, and the Mean Lock was indeed an aberration. It was essentially still the same creature as before, though with some updated and modified mechanics, especially concerning the telepathic fear projections and the ability score damage that they caused. I personally came across the Mean Lock in 3.5e in issue 146 of Dungeon Magazine, which presented the first level adventure, Escape from Mean Lock Prison. I'd never heard of a Mean Lock before then, but the adventure turned out to be one of the best I've ever run. The characters were tricked into entering an underground prison overran by 
terrified to insanity escaped prisoners and these horror-inducing monsters that had come up from a subterranean lair, what ensued was a session filled with madness and terror and nearly a total party kill with only the magical prowess of the wizard saving the day at the last minute before everyone was dragged unconscious into the mean lock tunnels to be transformed. Then we get to 4th edition and it's Monster Manual 3 from 2010. The mean lock is still an aberration here, still has the same overall tone and lore, but the mechanics are 4th editionified. So watch out! These mean locks have a bunch of cool mechanics with rad but ultra balanced at will and encounter powers. The 4th edition system was great for non magical monsters and character classes. Suddenly they came to life, they had all kinds of interesting maneuvers and themes. But the 4th edition system was really wacky for creatures and classes that were based on magical effects, as suddenly they were crammed into the same mechanical template as the mundane or martial stuff. Judged within the context of 4th edition, the Mean Lock is actually a pretty cool monster. It even has Mean Lock Corruption, which was a scaling condition that works similar to disease, but it was contested with insight instead of endurance. The final stage had the victim in a freaky trance, shambling towards the mean lock's lair so he could go home to become one of them. And now we have 5e with the mean lock from Volo's Guide to Monsters. Fay. <laughs> mean locks are described as corrupted and twisted fay. Their alignment even got changed to neutral evil because almost no fay are lawful evil. Ah! And they took away the mean lock's awesome mental phantasm ability. There's also a sidebar that describes exactly how the mean locks transform a victim. Up to four mean locks gather around an incapacitated creature and telepathically fill its mind with disturbing sounds and images. Then after one hour, the target must make a wisdom saving throw or take 3d6 psychic damage. Each hour, the target is slowly damaged until it reaches zero hit points and transforms into a new mean lock. You see, part of what made the mean lock scary all along was not knowing what would happen once a person got dragged down into their putrid lair. The imagination can come up with all sorts of vague and horrible wonderings. It can even induce paranoia as people speculate and even argue about this gruesome yet unknowable fate. If you give us exact information and instructions, you've dispelled the magic of it and we're left just following numbers and mechanics. By the slithering scrotum of Cthulhu, the 5th edition mean lock is heresy. Heresy, I say! So here's a really cool fey monster, the Red Cap. It's a bloodlust-fueled, iron boot-wearing, oversized, sickle-wielding killer. In the material plane, there are certain locations where the border between the mortal world and the Feywild is thin. These can be Fey crossings or simply a place that has wild Fey magic running through it. If someone commits murder in such a place, specifically a gory murder, bloodstained mushrooms will pop up where the victim's blood poured out onto the ground. These mushrooms grow and grow until red caps leap up from the ground, donned in their namesake headwear. Most red caps are solitary wanderers and reavers, though some do operate in groups, particularly if they're hired by a strong leader who promises them payment and plenty of violent action. But being the chaotic evil bastards that they are, it's difficult to keep red caps around for too long. Upon spawning, red caps also possess a peculiar natural impulse to track down their maker and make of him their first kill, a kind of self-inauguration in blood. The red cap's limited abilities and lack of options do hold it back from reaching beyond low B tier, but for what it is, it's a great fey creature, sure to leave an impression on whoever encounters it. The sprite is one of the most classic fey creatures in existence. When we hear the word fairy, that generic image of the little winged person that we think of is basically a sprite or a pixie. Of course, classically speaking, the term fairy encompasses many, many different varieties of creatures. 
While pixies are the more charming and lovable of the fairy folk, sprites are the more serious and territorial ones. Are these little buggers a tired old trope? Or do they have the staying power to remain eternally inspiring? Sprites live in woodland areas, and wherever they dwell, nature thrives. Flowers blossom in abundance, mushrooms sprout in vibrant hues, trees are lush with leaves and fruit. The sprites are the wardens of these spaces. Should interlopers happen by, the sprites, cloaked in invisibility, sneak up and touch the creatures, thereby learning the trespassers' state of mind and their emotions, possibly even their alignments and creature types. Only those who the sprites find worthy may pass through. Those with good intentions, such as adventurers on a quest to rid the forest of a corrupting menace, are welcomed, even aided by the sprites. Those who do not possess such virtuous notions receive no such embrace. The sprites distract away neutral parties and outright assault evil parties. While an individual sprite is a tiny thing with a mere two hit points, they gather in large groups and fire hails of tiny arrows that carry a sleep-inducing poison. Mechanics-wise, the sprite has a high attack bonus. For a lowly CR 1 quarter, it has a plus 6 to hit with its short bow. Oddly, for melee, it has a long sword with a pathetic plus 2 to hit. Why in the nine hells don't they wield rapiers or short swords? That way they could make use of their high dexterity. This detail annoyingly makes no sense. The arrow poison has a mere DC 10 to resist being poisoned and the target must fail by five or more to fall unconscious. However, bear in mind that the target will probably face a barrage of these little attacks. Imagine being struck by dozens of toothpicks shot at you at the same time. You're bound to roll low on at least one of the saving throws, and off to sleepy time dreamland you go. However, taking any amount of damage does wake you up, which begs the question, what if you get knocked unconscious from the first shot in a volley, but then some of the later shots in that same volley hit you? Imagine eight sprites attack. You're hit by the first one, you fail your save by five or more, you go unconscious. Then the second shot hits you, dealing measly one piercing damage, but do you immediately wake right back up? I guess the DM could roll each of them one by one, but that doesn't make too much sense. When a group of enemies attack together, it's just faster to roll all the attacks at once, and then the DM will just call out the to hit results, or even just how many hit. It also doesn't work in character, as a group of archers would just fire all at once. They're not going to stand there one at a time waiting to see the results of each shot. Maybe the implication is that the character takes all the damage from the whole volley at once, then you check to see if he falls unconscious from the poison? I guess? The sprite's heart sight ability also has a low DC 10 charisma saving throw to resist. A sprite does automatically sense the target's emotional state no matter what, but the creature has to fail the save in order for the sprite to learn the creature's alignment. Celestials, fiends, and undead automatically fail the save, by the way. I suppose, again, here it's more a matter of volume, as like a dozen sprites all lay their itty bitty fingers on the target at the same time and at least one of them is bound to succeed, and then he'll tell all his little sprite allies what he's learned. Does the intruding creature perceive tiny little hands touching it? Maybe the sprites have to make sleight of hand checks against the target's passive perception. Does the intruder know that it's making a charisma saving throw against some effect? It seems to me that making a saving throw is something that you're aware of, as you or at least your instinctual defense mechanisms are actively trying to fend off some kind of harm. Unfortunately, D&D does not address these inevitable questions regarding abilities like the sprites, heart sight, and sleep poison. Did the designers just want to leave these things in our hands? Are they oversights? I don't know, but the longer I play and analyze 5th edition, the more I realize that the game really could have used another round of development and revision. So what do I think about the sprite? The serious-faced miniature army of the fairy forest. Well, I did put them in B tier, so they're certainly not bad. 
being able to fly and remain invisible at will are pretty amazing in their own right. If nothing else, it makes for some elite spies or scouts or rogue types. The sprite does fill an important place in the realm of fairy. I've concluded that I'm not willing to entirely brand them as a tired old trope, but something doesn't fully work about them. They feel like a somewhat misguided interpretation of a truer archetype, like something that classically had more depth, but got a bit bastardized through modern pop culture, which includes gaming culture. They aren't reaching their full potential in any area, but they're still a bit above average. The Darkling is a monster that I've grown somewhat fond of. Like the Red Cap, its simple abilities hold it back from a higher slot in this ranking, which it probably is deserving of. Now this monster does call to mind something which, for lack of a better term, I call the Dark Version Effect. It's simple. Take any character, any trope from any game or media, and just make the Dark Version of it. Elves? Dark Elves, Phoenix, Dark Phoenix, Sansa Stark, Dark Sansa, Garuk Wildspeaker, Dark Garuk, Sorcerer, Dark Sorcerer, and so on and so on. Now, I am not saying that this outright is a bad thing. It's annoying enough hearing people who call everything edgy instead of thinking for themselves and formulating their own critique as to why something doesn't work. Honestly, I think that the intention most creators have when implementing the dark version is a good intention. They want to give a new twist or add some additional depth to a familiar character. We humans are allured by the dark side. As much as it can harm, corrupt, even destroy us, it also holds all the potential of the unknown, the thrill of adventure, the promise of lost treasure, the hints at secrets and transformation. Like with any other design approach, the problems with the dark version arise only when it's done in a cheap and misguided way. One of my favorite Halloween characters and scary stories of all time is the Headless Horseman. He's the dark version of a typical horseman or a knight, but he has depth, history, and mystery. He's connected with other characters like Ichabod Crane and Brom Bones from Sleepy Hollow. His jack-o'-lantern adds an additional layer beyond him just being a ghost horseman. The jack-o'-lantern itself is a dark version of a pumpkin, and it contains its own trove of history and lore and personal connections to us. This is an example of the dark version done really well. Batman is an example of the dark version of a superhero done well. Batwoman is not. The Darkling race traces its origin back to a noble fey house in the Summer Court. The leader of this house gravely offended the Summer Queen, and in her wrath, she placed a curse over the entire house. What exactly he did is not known, as it seems the Summer Queen struck all memory and record of it from existence. In fact, she even wiped out the very recollection of his name, and nowadays he is only referred to as Duvkatha, which is Irish for Dark Crow. The curse made Duvkatha and the members of his house absorb light whenever they were exposed to it, which not only aged them incredibly rapidly, but once filled with it, they would explode in a burst of radiance. The members of this house, henceforth called Duvsith, aka Darklings, cloaked themselves in thick black garb and shunned all exposure to light sources. Being fey, however, they have a love and even a need for artwork and beauty. At times they will risk gazing upon objects of art, or the luminescent celestial bodies of nature, or even the simple pleasure of a candle. By the way, this is a trait that all us humans have. Without the arts in all their forms, life really just makes no sense. Beauty as well is like a glimpse of the divine. It captivates and moves us to no end. The Darklings do have dark vision, but remember that in D&D, dark vision only functions out to a certain distance, 120 feet in the case of the Darklings. And when you're in complete darkness, 
you only see things in a gray, hazy sort of way. So imagine living your whole life within a limited field of vision and everything is filtered by a murky shroud. What a terrible, terrible curse. The fact that the Darklings are chaotic neutral and not some form of evil is a miracle. The fact that their race has managed to survive is also a miracle. But the survival instinct is a strong one, as is the quest for meaning. It is also eternal and endlessly moves us. Who have the Darklings turned to in their worship? The Monster Manual does not say. I think the Raven Queen would make for a great candidate. Darklings do still hold to certain rites and rituals in their culture. In fact, once a Darkling reaches a respected state of advancement in his community, he can go through a mystical ritual, which, if he survives, is transformed into a Darkling Elder, which is a taller, more powerful version of the Darkling. What are the differences between the two? Well, the standard Darkling is small-sized, the Elder's medium. The standard one has Death Flash, which releases a blinding light upon its death. The Elder's Death Burst, in addition, deals a bit of radiant damage. The standard Darkling has a sneak attack of 2d6. The Elder's is 3d6. The Elder can cast the ever so potent Darkness spell once per rest. Keep in mind here that all Darklings possess a 30 foot blind sight sense, which lets them make excellent use of this darkness effect. A further detail is that part of the vaguely dangerous ritual to become an elder involves creating glowing tattoos on the subject's body, which let out tiny amounts of the light trapped within. Volo's guide doesn't directly state it, but the implication to me seems to be that these tattoos are more like carvings in the Darkling's skin. Now I'm thinking about the Headless Horseman's jack-o'-lantern again. There's some good stuff with the Darklings, and I see big potential for all kinds of stories or adventures featuring them. They're a monstrous race with great hooks and a lot of motivation and a lot of flexibility. They're more like Batman, not Anakin Skywalker. The next entry we come across is also a Ling, the Quickling. By the way, the suffix Ling comes to us from Germanic roots and can be found in many other nouns. It can mean simply having to do with, as in quickling, changeling, hireling, or it can have a diminutive effect, such as darling or duckling. The quickling also comes to us from Volo's Guide to Monsters, and is also a little guy, this time tiny size. It's also chaotic, chaotic evil to be precise. And it also is threatened with a short lifespan due to a Fey Queen's curse. In this case, the Queen of Air and Darkness from the Gloaming Court cursed a particularly slothful and lazy race of Fey that they would forevermore exist in an accelerated state of being. They shrunk to a fraction of their former size, and they live and move at lightning fast rates. This caused their lifespans to greatly hasten as well, with the typical quickling not making it past 15 years. From a quickling's perspective, the world around them is a tedious place. People walk with slow, plodding steps and speak like cows in slow motion. Even an arrow shot from a longbow seems to just crawl through the air. From the other race's point of view, a quickling is just a blur of movement that speaks in a trill of rapid chirps. Quicklings have their own agendas, for which the book unfortunately doesn't provide any strong hooks or story leads. And as the fey buggers that they are, they love pulling cruel pranks and causing mischief that borders on sadistic. A quickling's speed is a stupendous 120 feet, and all attack rolls made against it have disadvantage. It also has evasion, like a rogue, allowing it to outmaneuver dexterity save effects, such as fireball or lightning bolt. In melee, a quickling can make three dagger strikes with a single action, which really is like a little rapier for it due to its very high 22 dexterity score. It has a two hit of plus eight. That's quite a lot for just challenge rating one. Its damage output is pretty high as well. One criticism I have here is that the Quickling should have the ability to use a bonus action like a rogue or a hasted creature. 
given everything about this creature's ecology and its hyper fast movement, it should be able to do things at least like disengage or use an object as a bonus action. I mean, the book literally says that they're so fast they can do things like untie boot strings and then retie them together or pull a chair out from under someone the instant they go to sit in it. Like the Darkling, the Quickling has flavor, has lore, and really it's a decent starting point for mechanics, but it needs something more if it wants to reach A tier. The Corrid. Yes, that's right. The Bloomin' Corrid. Another small-sized chaotic fay from Volo's Guide. Many types of fairies are we folk, and we're all wild-hearted bastards. What do you expect? Fair enough. You know, I like you, Corrid. I like it when you stop taking the piss out of us, Faye. Well, how about some earthy drum rhythms to dance around to? Now that's better. Honestly, I do like the Corrid, in sort of the same way that I like the Gallop Doer. Oh, I'm quite fond of them blockheads. Right on. Now, will you let me get on with this without interrupting me? Well, yeah, sorry about that. Corrids are short, hairy, yet stony fey creatures with goat legs. They have an incredible empathy with all things of the mineral kingdom. They can smell different types of stone and metal as readily as humans can see different tones of color. They sense where there are caves and easily perceive secret passageways hidden in stone. Whenever they stand on the earth, they are supernaturally powerful, even hurling rocks as big as themselves. They can sense the movement of creatures along the ground, mold rock like clay, burrow at full speed through stone, and call up earth elementals. Really, the Korids are the fey masters of earth, and very few other beings can rival their earthen powers. In addition to this, Korids have magical hair. Yes, nothing says fairy tale like enchanted hair. They grow the hair on their heads to incredibly long strands, then once cut, the hair turns into whatever material is used to cut the hair. So, iron shears makes a strand of iron cable. And Korids can animate and control these ropes, which, beyond all the regular utility purposes of rope, can also bind up and restrain targeted creatures. Korids also have stone camouflage, walloping great clubs, and innate spells such as commune with nature, meld into stone, stone shape, conjure elemental as a sixth level spell, and Otto's irresistible dance, hearkening to the Korid's love of dancing and drum rhythms. My only real nitpicks with the Korid are that its animated ropes DC is just too low. DC 13 on a challenge rating seven monster just doesn't quite cut it. And also, it could use a bit more in terms of lore hooks and defined goals. Are the Korids trying to build the Feydark's greatest castle city, but they're being harried and raided by Fomorians or crossed over drow? Are the Korid king and queen searching for a long lost magical crystal that is the key to their race's future? Again, it's nice to give us something beyond just repetitious descriptions of the monster. Okay, Korid. Thanks for having me over for a bit. Uh, take care, man. Any time, you crazy bard! In mid-B tier, we start getting into hags, some of the best monsters in D&D, and really all of fantasy and mythology in general. I've been speaking about hags and witches since the early days of my channel, with hags making it into my very first monster ranking video ever, Top 10 D&D Monsters from 2010. <laughs> yeah, I've been at this for a little while now. The Hag is a potent archetype and one that touches on deep-seated fears within the human psyche. What if the lifestyle you've been leading, the delicious fruit you've been eating, has all been a poison given to you by an ugly, twisted, bitter old crone who wasted her own life and traded away her virtue for a dark shadow of power? What if the dream you've been chasing is but an illusion woven by the gnarled hands of a hag who would use you for her own vile wishes? There are many things to be afraid of. Wasting your time, your money, your life is certainly a powerful one. Being manipulated by a corrupted mother figure into wasting your life takes things a layer deeper. 
This is not the savage beast who comes howling and gnashing with fangs, nor is this the enemy soldier charging to clash with you on the field of battle. This is the deceiver who dwells in the foul parts of the wilderness, yet within your own neighborhood. The one who will steal away your children, poison your sustenance, curse your home and your town, and manipulate you according to her dark will. Her heart is filled with bitterness and sin, and ultimately tragedy. As she is unloved, she has no life, and she is grotesque. The hag is the female embodiment of pure evil, the antithesis of the caring mother and the beautiful maiden. The sea hag, for whatever reason, is the lowliest of hags in D&D. She's a mere CR2 in 5th edition, or CR4 if she's part of a coven with two other hags. The sea hag is the ugliest of all the hags as well, which is saying a lot. Even when she uses her illusory appearance, she still appears ugly no matter what form she projects. So horrific is her appearance that humanoids who start their turn near her might become frightened. She possesses a death glare, which allows her to reduce a frightened creature to zero hit points if it fails a DC 11 wisdom saving throw. Otherwise, a sea hag in a direct fight uses slashing from her claws. The sea hag hates everything that is beautiful and festers with rage and vindictiveness to corrupt or destroy all that possesses beauty. This is typical for all hags, but it seems to be even stronger in the sea hag. I suppose the sea hag, being the simplest, wildest, and least strong of hag kind, makes me think of life's origin in the sea. She might represent the awkward larval or amphibious stage of life, as in the primordial epochs, creatures were crawling slowly from the watery depths onto the land. There are more hags to come, as all of them are fey creatures, except the night hag whose infernal dealings long ago turned her into a fiend. The spiritual counterpart of the sprite is the pixie, who is also represented in popular media by what most people refer to simply as fairy. She's a cute little woodland person with wings like a butterfly or a dragonfly, who goes flitting about trailing pixie dust and giggling with curious amusement. In D&D, the sprite represents the serious woodland guardian fairy and the pixie represents the playful woodland trickster fairy. Pixies are also highly squishy with one single hit point to them, though they are great in number and can use invisibility at will. The pixie is one of the rare creatures in D&D that actually has no attack. She carries no weapon, nor does she have any natural weapons. That said, she does possess a number of innate spells, including polymorph, so if she needs, she can turn herself into an elk or a giant owl, though Polymorph does state that you take on all the ability scores of the new form, so her strategy and memory would suddenly be reduced to something with an intelligence of two. She also has Confusion, Sleep, Entangle, Phantasmal Force, and a few other really cool spells at her disposal. Combined with the pixie's social and curiously interactive nature, she really is overall a solid entry. Pretty much any scene that features a pixie will have the characters role-playing, and they'll find leads to an adventure or a side quest, or just good old jolly time playing around with fairies. Sure, this may not fit the tone of every single campaign, but for the fantasy genre as a whole, few things are as classically fun as reveling about with some pixies. Now, the whole fairy thing has been overdone in popular media, but if you think about it, so have other figures such as the knight, the wizard, the witch, the dragon. We've all seen them a billion times as well, and we're not about to abandon them, nor could we if we tried. So, the fairy, it has an enchanting quality. It calls to us to venture into mystery and the allure of the deep woods. Continuing on with the curious and revelrous theme, we encounter the satyr, who takes things in a more hedonistic direction. With their goat legs and ram horns, they almost resemble a devil. All you would have to do is just give them glowing red eyes, and suddenly they would look like fiends. But they're not. They're actually quite the opposite of devils, as they are wild, frolicking spirits who seek out pleasure and feasts, basically the wild party-goers of D&D. 
This creature comes to us from Roman mythology and even earlier from Greek mythology. They're associated with gods like Dionysus and Pan, and they always possess a sexual theme. Classically, the satyr is depicted as naked and often aroused, playing music on pipes and singing and dancing and drinking. Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, of course, puts clothes on the satyr because, well, now our society is immature and confused in regards to sexuality, and Wizards of the Coast wants to produce a successful game that doesn't offend people or make them too uncomfortable. Of course, this then puts things in an awkward stepping on eggshells tone, which we see all throughout current D&D and Magic the Gathering and other games too, where there are certain mature themes which are totally okay, from bloody violence to demon summoning. And at the same time, other themes are taboo, such as nudity or classical mindsets. The art quality itself is superb. So hats off to whoever painted the 5th edition Seder. It looks great. And I also have to praise the poem that is included as though it's scrawled on a piece of parchment right there on the page. The Sonnet of the Naughty Seder. <laughs> so it does give us a little bit of titillation, I suppose, but they keep it pretty reined in. Naughty Seder, it's a bit redundant, sort of like saying tall giant. Statistics-wise, the satyr is a mere CR one-half for some reason. Well, within the context of its own power level, it is moderately strong. It's a skirmisher-type warrior. It has magic resistance, as do other types of fey. And its classic and most interesting ability is its music. The panpipe melodies it plays can charm, frighten, or put foes to sleep, which is enough to cause a good amount of unpredictability and challenge in any encounter. Of course, satyrs don't even have to be in a combat encounter. They are one of the most socially interactive creatures out there. They're like the ultimate extroverts. Well, they and brass dragons. If you are a DM, don't hesitate to let loose and really ham it up when role-playing a satyr NPC. If you need a template to follow, think of Captain Jack Sparrow or Robert Bobby B. Baratheon or even Timon and Pumbaa from Lion King, or even Quagmire from Family Guy. These characters can be rotten bastards, but somehow we love them, or we at least forgive them because they seem helpless to the influence of their fiery passions and wild libidos. A satyr who acts this way with the player characters in D&D can get them into all kinds of unforgettable situations. In the very least, it will prod and provoke reactions from the characters, and it's always interesting to see how players handle such role-playing decisions. Is the satyr ultimately flawed? Is he doomed to bring about his own downfall as so many wild partiers do? He may not even ponder such questions. He might respond with a question of his own. What's the point of living if you're not having fun? For those of us who live in the real world, having fun is not the point of life. Too much can lead to our destruction, just as too much negativity can. But it sure can be a blast. We have reached the top of B tier. The Ver Hag adds a wintry theme onto the already potent Hag archetype. From Volo's Guide, this pale skinned winter witch comes stalking, taking great delight when people commit vile acts in order to survive during severe cold or food shortages. She especially delights in people who commit such evil when it's unneeded, such as a selfish merchant hoarding more food than he would need while his neighbors starve. This is how we know we are facing true evil, the darkest form of malevolence, when someone takes gleeful pleasure out of others' most horrific suffering. It is because of evil creatures such as this that paladins swear oaths to strike down the wicked, and rangers vow to hunt and slay the hideous villains who layer in the wilderness. The Ver Hag also has the classic witch's staff, which functions as a flying broomstick and provides her with dangerous magic spells. As you would imagine, the Ver also has spells that deal cold damage, like Ray of Frost, Wall of Ice, and Cone of Cold. She can also paralyze characters at will with Hold Person, and she uses Control Weather to wreak snowstorms and cold snaps upon settlements. 
A final ability she possesses is Maddening Feast. If a person is killed, probably during a combat encounter, she dismembers and devours parts of the character right then and there. Those who witness this might be driven into a madness-inducing terror, which actually says in the stat block the affected creature speaks gibberish and is controlled by the DM. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to top off the Fey B tier than with the Verhag. Now we have reached the grove at the heart of the Fey Wild. This is the Wellspring, the source of magic and fantasy and all the whims of the imagination. A tier represents the all around very best that D&D &D has to offer. At the beginning of A tier, we come across the Dryad, an alluring Fey that's technically a type of nymph. Once more, it's a creature from Greek mythology. The nymphs are feminine spirits who are manifestations of nature. They appear as beautiful maidens who emerge from the land. They imbue, preserve, and protect what element of nature they're connected with. For example, naiads are nymphs of rivers and streams, and elseeds are nymphs of fields and groves. They're neutral aligned beings, and they might help mortals if they see fit, but they can also be dangerous. For one, they don't share the sensibilities of us mortals. A nymph might look like a delicate maiden, but she is not so limited and fragile as a human. She is a force of nature. So while you might drool over the thought of being seduced by a river nymph who beckons you to make love to her, your pleasure will end once you start drowning in the process. Fey hearts are capricious, and this can lead to them being careless with mortals. The Dryad is a tree nymph. Technically, they're associated with oak trees, but that detail gets eschewed sometimes. Like all nymphs, a Dryad is an elusive creature. She's bound to a particular tree, which she is one with, body and spirit. Her own health is tied to the tree. If it lives on, she as well stays young and vibrant. If it is harmed or diseased, she too will be hurt. If it's destroyed, she will go mad. As you can imagine, dryads are highly protective of their home trees. Because of this, they usually don't venture far away for very long. Like sprites, dryads defend their woods passionately, though they will help adventurers or travelers whose intentions align with the dryad's own values. A dryad has a number of interesting abilities that make her suited for roles like a druid or a scout or a skirmisher, even a bit of a controller. She can speak with animals and plants, which provides a wealth of different possibilities there. She can stride through trees, which functions like a short range teleportation from tree to tree, though it doesn't take up any action, it's just part of her move speed. In forest terrain, this is really potent. Her innate spells include Druidcraft, Entangle, Goodberry, Barkskin, Pass Without Trace, and Shalele. I am a bit puzzled by the awkward attack description in her stat block, which jams a non shillele and a Shalele club attack into the same attack line. Why? Just give her an at-will attack that functions as potently as Shalele. She's a living manifestation of a tree. There's no reason why she should have limitations on wielding a club infused with nature magic. And in true nymph tradition, she has a fey charm ability, which she can use to charm and influence humanoids and beasts. This is a wonderful ability, full of combat effectiveness, as well as utility and role-playing potential. And it serves to mechanically support the fact that the Dryad is one of the most beautiful creatures in all of Dungeons & Dragons. I'm not sure that challenge rating 1 is appropriate for a Dryad, I think it should be a bit higher, given that she's such a force. And of course, it would have been great to see a couple additional stat blocks, perhaps an advanced Dryad Enchantress, and a dark version Dryad who is chaotic and mad after her home tree was despoiled or chopped down. With some additional lore to deepen the storytelling, the Dryad could reach even higher into A tier. The Green Hag is the classic green-skinned old witch. Like all hags, she's absolutely rotten to the core. Nothing delights her more than tragedy and downfall. Those who enjoy success or love are her foremost targets. Her heart churns with bitterness and resentment, 
and using her schemes and deceptions, she plots to undo the good that others have. Well, hello, pretty young girl. You don't need those seven dwarves. Here, have this delicious apple. The green hag is slightly stronger than the sea hag, being CR3. She's still amphibious and can attack with raking claws, though her illusory appearance is not limited to only ugly forms. A green hag could appear stunningly gorgeous, which is all the more disturbing. Illusion magic really is her specialization. She has at-will invisibility, like a sprite does, except that she cannot be tracked unless it's by magical means. She can also cast minor illusion, dancing lights, and vicious mockery, as well as mimic the sound of any animal or humanoid voice. A green hag makes for a great recurring villain, especially at low levels. In my home campaign, there was a green hag that had the party fooled for the longest time that she was a powerful Medusa, such that the characters feared her and dared not risk a fight with her. Only once they were high level, they discovered this secret, and the hag's defeat was swift. But the role playing and storytelling she injected into those scenes were unforgettable. That is often the good indication that there is something really nice going on with a monster. It lends to you creating memorable moments in your game. And being able to retell D&D memories with your friends is one of the greatest things ever. It's more than just quoting lines from a movie that you all watched. You've created a personal mythology drawn from the adventures that you had. Near the top of this ranking, we find the only fae that's in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. I'm not sure why they skimp so much on fae in that book. The Eladrin, yes, it's pronounced Eladrin, rhymes with Aladdin. For the longest time, I'd pronounced it Eladrin, which I thought sounded smoother and more elven. But back in 2008, in the D&D podcast, Mike Merles and Dave Noonan corrected me, answering my mailbag question about the subject. Hello, and welcome to the D&D Podcast. All right, the next question coming from Esper. Uh, this is actually kind of a fun question uh, about pronunciation. Aladrin. Also agreed. Oh, and we have a parenthetical there. Please tell me this does not rhyme with Aladdin. I'm sorry. The Aladrin is a creature that has gone through a number of changes and revisions across the editions of D&D. It originally came out in the 90s, so second edition, through a spin-off card game called Blood Wars and soon after in Monstrous Compendium Appendix 2 for the Planescape setting. They were inhabitants of Arborea, the lush, chaotic good-aligned plane that exists between the wilderness of the Beastlands and the heroic domains of Ysgard. So the Eladrin were something like a cross between a Celestial and a Fae, and they could travel between planes to fight against evil and tyranny. 3.5e continued with this overall theme without too big of a change, The Monster Manual gave us the Berlani and the Gale, which were chaotic good celestials. Then, 4th edition changed the Eladrin into a playable humanoid race who came from the Feywild, or their ancestors came from the Feywild. They were basically the High Elves of 4e, with innate magic and increases to dexterity and intelligence. 5e once again has overhauled the Eladrin, now they're definitely Fey. They are related to the Elves, Some say they are elves that have been transformed or imbued by living so long within the wild magic of the Feywild. It just flows through them, all of its ardor and beauty. So tied to the Feywild are they that each Eladrin embodies the appearance and traits of a season. So autumn Eladrin, winter, spring, and summer. An Eladrin's physical characteristics and powers depend on what season he is bound to. Oh, wait, did I say bound? Well, not really, and Aladdin can just switch uh, the season after a long rest. I guess it's pretty cool, though being tied to seasons of the material plane does seem like something that would be possessed by a being from the material plane. The Feywild is so unbridled and supernatural. I imagine it would have all kinds of seasons, various meteorological phenomena not found in the world. Honestly, these 5e Eladrin remind me more of nymphs. I liked the fairy angels that they had been all along. 
it harkens back to the classic fairy tales in which characters like Pinocchio were visited by angel-like fairies who gave them wisdom and powers and healing and overall served as forces of higher good. In terms of the abilities, the Aladdin of the Four Seasons have a pretty diverse array of interesting options. They all share some common things, though. They all fight with long swords and long bows. They have the same AC, hit points, resistance to non-magical attacks, magic resistance, and phase step, a bonus action 30-foot teleportation that harkens to the 4E Aladrin. The Autumn Aladrin favor peace and healing. They have a charming aura which extends out to 60 feet, and they can cause charmed creatures to miss on attack rolls. They can cast calm emotions and sleep at will, and possess some really powerful healing spells, even raise dead. The spring Eladrins caper about in joy and mischief. They also have a charming aura, but no additional interesting effect, just plain charmed condition. Their spells include Tasha's hideous laughter, confusion, suggestion, hallucinatory terrain, and Otto's irresistible dance. My goodness, this just made me realize, where's the Grig in 5e? Actually, he's been missing since the 3.5 monster manual, hasn't he? Chirp on, cricket men, wherever you are. Summer Eladrins radiate hot emotions, notably anger. Instead of a charm aura, they have a fear aura, and, well, hmm, they don't have spells. They do have better weapon attacks than the other Eladrin, and Perry? What? The hell is with Perry. I saw the same thing with the Hobgoblin Warlord. These creatures are fairly high challenge rating and they represent expertise in the art of swordplay. They're masters in weapon technique, yet their only maneuvers are basic parries that even a low level character could know. You know, blocking, like one of the most fundamental techniques of melee combat. Summer Eladrin actually is a bit disappointing. And lastly, the winter Eladrins brood in sorrow. It has a sadness aura, which technically imposes charm, though the target suffers disadvantage on ability checks and saving throws. Oh, the rare disadvantage to saving throws. Such a potent effect. The winter Eladrin spells are limited to fog cloud, gust of wind, cone of cold, and ice storm, which are thematically appropriate and effective for battlefield control and area damage. It would have been nice to get a few more unique abilities with the Eladrin. After reading through them all and reflecting on them, nothing really stands out as being truly unique, except maybe the Autumn Eladrin's foster peace reaction that makes the charmed creature's attack automatically miss. Otherwise, they're all sort of a generalized Eldritch Knight with the minor short range teleportation and the charm aura. Also, Unsurprisingly, their lore is on the generalized side. Effective, but still vague and broad. The Eladrin would work really well with each other, perhaps a scene that is a ravishing of the four seasons all at once, but they don't quite have what it takes to make it into high A tier. Really, the Eladrin make me wish that we had entries for Archfey in 5e, but Mordenkainen's Tome, fantastic though it may be, is a book that's more about demons and devils. So here's to hoping on the next Monster Manual book. At the top of the Fey ranking is the Annis Hag from Volo's Guide. The Monster Manual describes the Sea Hag as the ugliest, but the most disturbing one, in my opinion, is the Annis Hag. They are the biggest of hag kind, making it into large size despite being hunchbacked. They are deformed, twisted, grotesque, end quote, can easily tear a grown man apart. Ugh. Like a true black-hearted witch, the Annis Hag loves to eat little children, and they even make leather out of the flayed skins of their victims. Now we're talking. The Annis Hags layer in hills and mountains, and they like to leave little tokens of their cruelty at the edge of civilization as a way to instill fear and paranoia into society. They delight in sowing these seeds of terror. They also create iron tokens, which are made from their own iron teeth and nails, and Annis Hag shapes and polishes the token into a coin, a ring, or other trinket. Whoever possesses it can have telepathic communication with the Hag, though probably does not realize who she actually is. 
the hag also perceives the direction of her own Iron Token's locations. Using her disguised self spell, an Anis Hag sometimes takes the form of a kindly old granny who befriends children. She spreads her corruption, convincing them that it's okay to have bad behavior and think naughty thoughts. Her goal is to turn such children into nasty little brats and destructive vandals. Anything that tears families apart delights the Hag. At this point, the Anis Hag really reminds me of the junk lady from Labyrinth, who disturbed me every time I watched that movie as a kid. This is not junk! Eh? A final bit of lore is that Anis Hags, though being fey, have a certain affinity for low ranking giants, things like ogres and trolls. These brutes are often living in very primitive tribes and rife with superstitions. The Anis Hag simultaneously manipulates them while serving as a sort of grandmother of the misfits. Ah, finally a monster with some great lore. There's enough lore seeds in the Anis Hag to develop an entire region, at least a town and a couple surrounding areas, complete with NPCs affected by this haggery. So as we're seeing, there are several B-tier entries in this ranking. Many fey creatures are pretty interesting. They have magical effects, sentience, and often interactive natures. Unfortunately, there are not a ton of fey creatures, which is not exactly an issue that's exclusive to 5e. We get hordes and hordes of undead and monstrosities, but fey seem more elusive. Well, that's their nature, I suppose. Having gone through the entries that we do have has only furthered my enjoyment of these magical tricksters from the realm of fairy tales. They encompass so much, from the fairest embodiments of beauty and grace to the most disgusting monsters of pure malevolence. They're us, really, as the human heart contains all the best and all the worst of existence. Above all else, the Fae touch upon that special place of imagination that we all share, especially us who love role-playing games and the fantasy genre. If you want to help keep that flame of imagination and inspiration kindled, consider becoming a patron of yours truly. You'll get exclusive content in my newsletter and a chance to have your own concept brought to life. Links are at the end of the video and down in the description. Thank you so much to all my patrons and an especially big thanks to those who participate in my live streamed campaign Warser, Adam Wood, Dennis Cropper, Vince, and Nick. May the Seely Fay come to your aid when you're lost in the woods, and may your adventures be many. Mm -hmm.